know what's so crazy is the area that I feel like the Lord really spoke to me is that area right there. At that time, it wasn't that many trees at the time, but my home church, the old church is right there. I don't know if I was singing and got stirred up, but I just remember getting, just stopping and getting apprehended. And I, what I believe was the voice of the Lord spoke to me then and said, I'm calling you to be a prophet to nations. My name is Chante Younger. My name is French, but I was born not in France, in a small town, a one stoplight town in the heart of Virginia called Gratna, Virginia. Ain't no big thing, but it's growing. <laughs> and what do I do for a living? I do people, I do ministry. Like growing up in Gretna, Virginia? Growing up in Gretna, I will say my family, especially in the early years, we were poor, but I didn't really know it. There were times where we lived with my grandparents, and so I had the blessed opportunity to be in a house with uh, three generations with my great grandparents, my grandparents, and my mother. And uh, there were times that we lived with my aunts. But then we did live by ourselves for a long period of time. And uh, my father wasn't in my life in the early, in my earlier years. He had went off into the military. Um, being in the military, he married someone else other than my mother, although he had been engaged to my mother. Although I knew of him, uh, he was a mystery to me. And But God raised up other men in my life growing up. I had a grandfather who I called my papa. But then I have people like Elder Stepman Payne, who was a school teacher who took me in and allowed me to call him dad. And um, I would stay with him and his family on the weekends. They would take me on trips with them. But I definitely miss the presence of my father. I always say that God will never leave you without a witness. You know, where there's a void, uh, where there's a space, you know, God is that space filler. But he uses people. As a matter of fact, when I was born, my mother was discouraged because my father wasn't there. And so what she did, as soon as she went back to the church, she put me in the hands of the pastor and says, I just want to dedicate him to God because I did not plan to raise a son by myself. My name is Diane Younger. I'm from Gretna, Virginia. When I got pregnant with Bishop Younger, I was 23 years old. I was a single mother and I didn't really understand a lot of things, you know, but I knew he was different. I called his godmother to come up to the house to let's anoint his room and pray for him because I told her that, you know, I feel like he had was possessed, you know, with a devil or demon or something. And she came and she talked to me and she told me that he wasn't possessed, he was just anointed. Right there. Uh -huh. And I never seen him up there playing basketball. He was always having church. <laughs> <laughs> so he grew up in it. Uh, yeah. Mother yeah. Marie Younger said that he wouldn't let the kids play games. Oh, yeah. He right. made them have church. That's right. Diane came to me one time, wanted me to pray for him because she didn't know what was wrong with him. He wouldn't go outside and play. <laughs> and what happened? God had his hands on him. Ah, glory. Hey. Yeah, he had his hands on him. <laughs> she, thought, she, thought, she thought he was possessed by a devil? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And you came over and, and you saw, you was like, no. No, I told one of them wrong with him. God had his hands on him. My godmother, Mother Frances Hall, spoke over my life. And now I'm 18, I'm an adult, so I'm sober. I have a, some sort of intellectual fortitude, so I understand what is being said. And my godmother says to me, she says, I don't know if you will ever pastor. She said, but I see you traveling all over this world, north, south, east, and west. She says, you're gonna be traveling so much. 
I can see that before you get out of one suitcase, you're going to have to take up another suitcase. Years have gone by since I was 18 years old. But I had a trip one time. I was preaching in Cape Town, South Africa. And the next day after my trip, I needed to go to uh, Brasilia, Brazil. And my pastor was going to go with me. And because Bishop Hall had never been to Brazil, uh, I needed to come back from South Africa and meet him to fly with him to Brazil. I flew from Cape Town, South Africa after being there for a week and flew to Washington, D.C. to meet my pastor, Bishop Hall. And when I got there, one of the brothers from our church walked up to me and says, Pastor, here's your suitcase with your fresh clothes. Let me take your old suitcase. And when that happened, it brought right back to my mind what God said to me at 15, I call you to be a prophet to nations. And what God used my godmother to say to me at 18, that before you can get out of one suitcase, you'll be picking up another. I would be in the bed sleep at night and think he was asleep and he would be up playing church. And he had a church under his bed with a cardboard with hair rollers and anything that you could name taped on it. And I would say, what is this? And he said, this is my choir, these are my diggings, these are my preachers. And he would have church all by himself, on up until the wee hours of the, of the night. And even coming up as a child, his only punishment that I could give him was, you're not going to church tonight. I grew up in a church called the Greater Canaan Church. It was a holiness church in, in my small town. I don't ever remember joining that church because I was actually born into that church with Bishop Raymond Bennett. It was fiery, it was passionate. We went to church all the time. And so I grew up in an incubator of faith, uh, prayer, prayer meetings. And so my Christian experience was really cradled in that small town, in that community, and in that church. I thought you were going to see me at grade school, now we're going to say thank you. <laughs> All you're going to have to do is tell God what to do. Ah! Huh. After you serve, you're just going to tell God what to do. They said Sister Barnaby lifted up her hand and she praised God as they took his body out of the house. I went to the funeral because I was like, Lord, how is Sister Barnaby doing? When they brought the family down the aisle, a man she had been married to for decades, they brought his body down the aisle. She came with her hands lifted up, praising God. And when she danced at the funeral, I came out the pulpit and I danced with her. And it was some time after I said, we better go by and check on Sister Verna May. Because she might have been hyped at that moment. But how is she doing now? We stopped here and left the car running. We walked in here, me, Walt, and Sister Evan. Mayor. And Walter and Evan and Sister Ronnie, we all spoke in tongues for 40 minutes before we ever spoke in English. The Holy Ghost met us at the door. You remember that, Sister Ronnie May? And Sister Ronnie May said, People were waiting for me to break down, but I already got a breakthrough. Oh, we have church anyway. And I had this little fellow used to be. It was church. I didn't care where we were. We didn't matter, did it? Here, anywhere, and, come on out outside. We make our own church, yeah. and other people just come around. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. They would come around, but they still didn't get what we was getting. <laughs> he said, Sister Brother Mason, one day I'm going to be like you. I said, Son, you don't stop at Sister Brother May. Hallelujah. Go higher than Sister Brother. Look what God did. I was probably a strange kid. I was a I was a church kid, you know. Uh, I was old, so probably at ten years old. I probably act I was acting like a, a fifty year old man uh, because that's who I was allowed to be around was the older people. I was that kid that always um, was sitting on the front porch with the older people so I could hear the conversations, you know. Um, I grew up with my with my grandmother and my grandfather riding a pickup truck. And I used to travel around with my godmother, Mother Frances Hall. 
and um, she used to take us around the churches and sing. And so <laughs> Saturdays were yard sales and flea markets. School, I went to school and I was wearing church shoes and jeans, you know, back then. <laughs> But uh, I loved God. Church was everything to me. God was everything to me. So even when we would play games like kickball and stuff growing up, there was always a prerequisite because I was the head of my cousins and I was the leader of the kids in the community. So I would be like, no, we got to have church first. So if we have church first, if everybody play church, then we can play kickball. My name is Allison Wrights and I'm from Gretna, Virginia. Bishop Younger, um, not only is he my pastor, our friendship goes back to the year of 1995 when we first met um, in school and then from there, of course, uh, throughout ministry. We went to Gretna High School in Gretna, Virginia. Going to school with Bishop Younger uh, was fun. We really didn't have any classes together. However, he was the type of person that everyone knew Shantae Younger at that time. Shekinah was back when it first started, it was almost like a mentoring program for the younger students or the younger kids that were in the area. So what we did was we went and he would pick them up and he would bring them to his grandmother's um, building that she had. And there uh, we would do like after school programming with them. And then eventually Shekinah turned into a ministry. What was it like going to high school with Bishop Younger? I met him at that transition from the little church boy to high school popularity. He became the choir director. And at that time, we had the largest high school gospel choir in the state. We had 143 voices. We raised money. We did a concert at Disney World, Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. So that was a really big deal, you know, for our uh, small town. Uh, we were on the news. Being a church kid in high school actually turned uh, for me, and, and it gave me some level of uh, popularity. And everybody went to the choir rehearsals because it was pure comedy. He would go after people if they did not get their note right and it would be joke. He would be like, uh, 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 who is that sounding so horrible? In the middle of the, in the rehearsal, he was like, who is that? Who is that? And then he would break it down and make everybody sing their part and he would be like, it's you, it's you. You over here, get with her and don't let her come back until <laughs> she get her note. There was started to be this influx of People from all parts of high school who became athletes, they were trying to figure out how they could be in choir and come from basketball practice and football practice. He always hates me because I always tell the story. He's so smart and let me tell you, when you talk to him, he knows history, the most educated person. And maybe that's why when he went to school he was bored. And he was so bored that when he would go to school he would bring a pillow and then when the teacher would start school, he would take his pillow out his book bag, lay it on the desk, and put his head down in the middle, in the middle of class. And I don't really know why he did that. And that was a turn for me because all of my life going through school, I wasn't a popular kid. I was a, I was a church kid. And so uh, there were times that I wanted to be in the inner circle, wanted to be in the inner crowd, but I wasn't made out for it. So all of a sudden, I finally get to my junior, going into my senior year, and I get something called popularity. And that popularity became a drug. It became a drug for me. Because all of my life, I guess going back to, to my father and, uh, and also being in other environments of wanting friends, uh, that I maybe felt not affirmed. So that time I got affirmed, um, I made some really bad choices. So then, uh, my senior year of high school, I actually failed. I actually failed in my senior year. Um, and I had to turn around and come back the following year. So you ask, what was it like being in school with Shantae Younger? It depends on what page of the story. After we graduated high school, he, he kept the choir going. And it went under the new a title as the Shekinah Outreach Ministries of Evangelism. I've always felt like he was the next T.D. Jakes, the next, you know, uh, that next preacher because he has a heart for the people. He's not moved by, he's not moved by people 
being famous, I always tell this story because it's such an inspiring story to me. I'll never forget when we were young and he was preaching and teaching and we got the opportunity to open up for Jesse Jackson. They had wanted us to come sing for Jesse Jackson in North Carolina A&T. And we had another event at some small church far off. I don't even know where it was, somewhere in Virginia, somewhere. And I remember he said, hey, y'all, we got a call to go to uh, sing for Jesse Jackson, but we're not going to go. And I'm like, why are we not going to sing for Jesse Jackson? Like, this is our moment. Let's go. He was like, no, we have to stick to our commitments and what, you know, what God has given us to do. If it was for us to do, we would have gotten that call first. And he said, you know, there will be other opportunities. And that has stuck with me forever that you don't move, you stick to your commitments. No matter how big the other opportunities look, sometimes you have to just stick with, you know, where God has placed you and you don't get moved by that. I got a job at a radio station in Chatham, Virginia. It was called WKBY, Inspirational 1080. Um, this radio station in Chatham was owned by Bishop William L. Bonner out of New York. And he had bought this station and made it a gospel station. And so I was almost like in an apprenticeship because I didn't have a license to be a radio announcer. But um, I was being a radio DJ because I knew gospel music. And so I did that for a little while. And I had to make a decision. The radio station hours were not enough to take care of my needs and wasn't enough to support my life. And at that time, my who who's now my pastor, Bishop Hall, was starting a church in Martinsville, Virginia. And I made that leap of faith to move to Martinsville to be with him as he planted his church called Reach Out Apostolic Tabernacle. My name is Lorenzo Hall. I live in Martinsville, Virginia. I've lived here for 51 years. I've been married to my wife, Lois, for 50 of those years. Well, the story goes back a long way. Uh, we knew one another, or I knew Bishop's grandparents. His mother uh, and, and her sisters were good friends to my sisters and my younger brothers. And our parents were friends, and they have been friends for years. We lived in the same community, walk over to one another's house, and because both of us had large families, we sort of connected together. And it just drew us closer and closer down through the years, and the relationship is still there. Bishop Younger came to Martinsville, I think he was 18 or 19 years old, and he became a part of our ministry 1997. He began uh, as our minister of music, and he really brought a lot of inspiration to reach out. I first met Bishop Younger as a teenager at Reach Out Apostolic Tabernacle. I was probably about 13 years old. He was actually my youth pastor. And think about it, I had joined the choir, had not even joined the church yet. And guess who our minister of music was? Bishop Younger. At that time, he was Brother Shante. And so he played the organ, and I literally joined the Reach Out Apostolic Church from the choir stand. Okay, first of all, Bishop Younger was a funny, very talented, um, but no tolerance choir member, I mean choir director. It was a time we were in Sunday morning worship, and we were singing a song, and I guess we were off key, I don't know what we were, and he kindly um, told us to stop and sat us down in the middle of Sunday morning worship. So he wasn't, he demanded excellence. And if we didn't have it, sit on down. We were the first church to my knowledge in our area that had praise dances and we would use the, not quartet singers, you know, what is it that you call the, um, uh, when you have a, praise and worship singers. Bishop Younger introduced that, and we're still there. And we were criticized so much when we started out with that because it, it wasn't a practice here in our area. But now, they are all the churches are doing it, but we were criticized, but we, we take no credit. That was Bishop Younger blessing us to be able to branch out from the tradition. Being an aspiring young guy, 
that loved life, he loved music, but he loved church. That set him apart from a lot, all of his peers primarily. So, and my mother would have prayer meetings at her house. Mother Marie would bring her children, and then Bishop Younger began to come. And I had another aunt named Catherine. She wasn't a preacher, but we called her Big Catherine. She was a strict apostolic, strict apostolic. And she took young Shante, and she began to cover him spiritually and teach him things. Even this day, there are some things he will not do because of things she told him and taught him. But he held to those values. So those women were very inspirational and inspiring to him. They taught him the power of prayer, getting into that word of God. He was only the one young person that I knew that grew up that I had left in that environment. So he didn't gravitate to playing sports in school, but he loved singing, he loved the choir, but he, he was never per se settled. And what I mean by that, because he was constantly doing something for the Lord. He had a group, uh, the Shekinah group, that they went around to the various HBCUs. He, he really ministered and sung. And, but then when he did his initial message here at Reach Out, and uh, then from the outset, the outset, I had never heard him preach. But when he preached that night, you know, I heard him do inspirational talks. I said, well, he is far more advanced already than a lot of preachers that I know his age. And, but he stayed humble with it. God began to move on him. And when he did talk to me, he said, Bishop, I just, uh, elder, I was an ordained elder then. He said, I want to talk to you about um, what God is calling me to do. I wasn't surprised because I know that calling was upon his life. I gave him my blessings. I gave him my blessings to the Lord, called him to start and form the Ramp Church. And as I said, the rest is history. So he has always had that biblical, that religious background, being based apostolic tradition, and he still adheres to those principles. After serving at Reach Out for uh, many years at my home church, you know, I wanted to go to school. I still had this desire to go to college, maybe to attempt to be normal for one time in my life. I felt like I had my whole youth had been given into church and ministry. So I wanted to go off to college uh, to create some sort of normality and to be a school teacher. While I was at Reach Out, I had, was doing ministry on other college campuses. We started a college campus ministry called Shekinah at North Carolina a and State University uh, with one of the young people who came out of my church named Brittany Smith. And so I had a college campus ministry and I hadn't even went to college. First of all, I get emotional thinking about reminiscing about the history of our church because I think sometimes I, I, I as a child growing up I didn't have anybody to give me a voice to, to fight for me um, but I remember leaving leaving for college um, going to North Carolina A&T State University Aggie Pride first of all everybody just said Brittany you going to this party school you know we're gonna pray for you we're gonna cover you and anoint your head with oil and we're gonna believe God that you're gonna stay saved and I was determined to stay saved so um, prior to leaving to for college I was a part of a ministry called Shekinah Outreach Ministries of Evangelism Incorporated and so at that time we had um, branches in Gretna, Virginia and Martinsville, Virginia and so when I came to college um, I decided that you know what I'm not gonna let my environment change me I'm gonna change and affect my environment so it was on August the 21st um, of 2002 that the Shekinah Outreach Ministry of Evangelism at North Carolina A&T State University was birthed and so in 2003 I applied to Liberty University again this time I was accepted. After being at the university, we started doing campus ministry there as well. So Shekinah now was not in just one location, it became in multiple locations, including Liberty University. It was in 2003 
three, I was walking down this stairwell in this building at, on the campus of Liberty University called DeMoss Hall. All of a sudden, I started to hear this music that was really familiar to me growing up in a black church. See, Liberty University was a predominantly white institution, so it was so many things that were just different for me culturally, but I loved it still, but it was something something familiar and warm about this sound. And so I followed the music. Lo and behold, I got to this room, I believe it was room 1300, and I saw a group of people just like, with their hands up, jumping up, shouting hallelujah, hallelujah. And some people were even like running around, and I was a little nervous to walk in, but I didn't feel like I could lose anything by walking in, so I opened up the door and I sat on the side, there was this man standing up and he was saying that someone's destiny was predicated on our obedience to God. And so I decided to, on that day, rededicate my life to Christ, or dedicate my life to Christ rather, and be a sold out Christian. And little did I know that my life was literally going to change forever. The beginning of the Ram Church started as a meeting in my duplex apartment on the top of Candles Mountain Road. It was just a few of us sitting um, on my used couch <laughs> talking about uh, what God had placed on my heart about starting a church. And from that meeting, we prayed and we talked about it and we were charged that we believed this is what God had called us to do. And so we had to find somewhere. Uh, Lynchburg City was very expensive. And at that time, we had a group of college students that were coming from Greensboro, North Carolina. So we went out in the country, a look closer to them, not close to them, but closer to them, in a town called Alta Vista, Virginia. And there was a train station there. It was a historic train station that people used for small meetings. And uh, we were blessed to get that train station room to have our first church service in for $25 a Sunday. And that was my price. I knew that if God brought a price like that, that means this has to be God. And so we started having church there. The first service was ram packed. And God met us there. It was such a move of God. And I opened up the doors of the church. And I did not know if anyone was going to join. But on that first day, 40 people joined, including my mother and other members of my family. I was shocked. Well, my name is Dorel. I joined the ramp. Uh, Hurt is when we first started the church. My name is Jamesia Harrison, and I joined the ramp the first Sunday in April, 2005. Um, if I remember correctly, I actually officiated the very first service that sure we had did. with the ramp church international, and I joined the same day. Officially, I joined by watch care. Okay. Because um, I was still a member, I, was, I came to Liberty and I was a member of my home church and I joined October 2015. Now I was at the first service, but I did not join until officially in October. 2015? Wow. Not 2015. That's what I was going to say, 2005. Say. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. 2005. You lost a whole decade. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> this like, is no. Man, okay. Must, yes, 2005. It's the age. It's okay, man. You put it some work. 2005. <laughs> October 2005. Man. Yeah. Gosh. It, it was interesting because, again, that wasn't my agenda and all of those good things. But technically, um, I was the first female minister licensed at the Ramp Church International. And the time that we received our license, well, my license, I was actually at the Love Church at that time, is when I actually received my official credentials as a minister of the Ramp Church International. When I came to the ramp it was just a reef like a refilling yeah and it was just one of those things where like okay I can do this on a regular now right. I don't have to be ashamed or I don't have to do it right. in a way yeah. where like you have to hide it or feel right. this, like feel like you the outcast oh my gosh and so yeah just to see just so many young college kids yeah. it just made me feel like wow like this is this is dope it was just one of those things where like the ramp you just like you guys say the ramp changed my life like and it saved my life yeah Darrell can I add this I 1000% agree with you because like for me when I was in high school my story was like oh you know 
Jamisi ain't going to the party. Jamisi ain't you know. She say I'm the one they would come to uh-huh. when they wanted to pray. Like you know what I'm saying? No real talk. Like my whole marching band, they would always ask me to pray before the games. You know, students would always come to me to pray with them and stuff like that. Like no, no. and then I used to be offended because I'm like, why well, can't why am I getting invited to nothing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, I understood. So when I came in contact with other young people yeah. that were on fire for God, it finally made me feel like, oh my God, Put your this on. is my tribe. Yeah. I can be who I'm free to be. Mm-hmm. You know, I can speak in tongues. I can fall out. I can get up, fall out again. Right. I, you know, go to the wall yeah. and do a wall praise. Like, I can do right. all of this and nobody's going to look at me like I'm crazy. Yes. Yeah. I'm just looking at, it's a quote that's on the wall that Bishop Younger says, is, even in smallness, excellent is demanded. Yeah. And it made me think about our first service mm-hmm. and the train station. Mm-hmm. And y'all, that train station was <laughs> probably as big as this one. Yeah. Literally. With yeah. fold out chairs, but I mean, we, we had, had hats yes. and suits on, and I mean, in that, like, it was this was not to be taken as a light service, right? This was right. our first service with podiums that we borrowed from the funeral home. <laughs> I mean, but we us, I mean, we treated even in smallness, excellence. it was a certain level of excellence. Absolutely. One day, I went to pick up the sound equipment at the music store. And when we went to the music store, the, uh, the, the music store told me, uh, I'm sorry, but we gave your sound up. We rented it out to someone else. And it was a gentleman in there. He said, um, I got some sound equipment you can use. I said, really? He said, yes, I also got a church you can use. And I told him, I said, how do you know about my church? He told me I was at your very first church service. He says, my church wants to be an assistance to you. He says, you can use our church in the afternoons. Well, I was trying to figure out how this would work because I'd already received a prophecy from Bishop Motley Davis that said to me, my next church building I move into would beat the price of the building I'm in right now. The only challenge with that, we were only paying $25. So I'm like, how can it get any cheaper? Well, this pastor said, Pastor Tracy McCutcheon, he says, you can use my church on Sunday afternoons for free. <laughs> and God is true to his word, because free is a whole lot cheaper than $25. We were growing in, in that building, in their church. We wanted our own space until we went over to the Hurt Virginia Plaza, another small town. I'm telling you, big things come out of small places. And uh, if you don't believe me, the question is still in the scripture, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Um, We were looking at a building and it was called, uh, it was called the Hurt Plaza and it was a a vacant space and it was the ABC store. It was the alcoholic beverage company um, where you could buy all the liquor you want. (laughs) But the place had closed down and moved in another location and it was a little small building and I wanted the space to start our church and I was looking at how we could lay it out. But right before we signed for that building, there was another larger building next door to it that had been a furniture company and an arcade. That building became available and that was double the size and we got the, the double the space for the same price. I mean, it's God's favor. God's favor had been on us everywhere we went. And so we got in there. This was our first home. We were ripping up the old carpet and we were putting down gold house carpet. (laughs) I remember my mother saying, why are we putting all this carpet in this church? Because I told my mother, even in smallness, excellence is demanded. We began to set our church up and, and God met us in that building. We treated that building like it was our very own cathedral. As a matter of fact, we called it the Storefront Cathedral. One of the most memorable moments at the Hurt Plaza, and I'm sure this is gonna be the consensus across the board, is we used to have this thing called the Sidewalk Praise. (laughs) So, so, you know, the spirit would be moving with the church services bumping, and it couldn't contain it. And so we would all run out and run out the church, bust the doors open, we get on the sidewalk. Now mind you, this is a plaza. This is a, there's a family dollar next door. There's a little uh, 
an Asian Japanese restaurant right next door. So there are people that are coming through here and the church music would be playing and everybody would be like, you know, run right outside and give a God a sidewalk praise. <laughs> and we literally, all of us, and we, <laughs> it's a bunch of us out there on the sidewalk just praising God, dancing on the sidewalk. But you know what? It was those crazy faith moments that I believe and to this day that I thank God for that I feel like sort of opened up the doors. Because but God says, the Bible says, God will take the foolish thing to confound the wise. So I remember us knowing that we had outgrown the storefront cathedral. I mean, we'd outgrown it. We had these pews that were breaking uh, with the weight of people. We had added an overflow section and our overflow section was beautiful white uh, lawn chairs that we had bought from the family dollar store next door. And we knew that our time there was coming to an end. And so we were really praying about where to go next. I was trying to make something happen. I was looking at building after building after building after building. I mean, there were times I was at night looking at buildings. Well, finally, one day I was leaving campus and I saw a building across from Liberty University, right there adjacent to the university. And it said, uh, for sale or lease. And I happened to be on the phone with our church administrator at the time. Her name is Kelly Galloway. And I told her, I says, she asked me what I had I been doing. I told her, well, just looking for buildings. And I said, I saw a building by Liberty, but I know we can't afford it. She said, oh, where is it at? I said, it's across the street from Hardest, right across from the university. She said, oh, well, you should go look at it. I was like, no, I'm not wasting my time. I'm exhausted. I know we can't afford it because it's right close to the university. Well, that Monday, it was my day off. And um, I was at home, and my church administrator called me. And she said, how much square footage is in our storefront cathedral right now? And I said to her, I don't know why. She said, because I'm at this building across from Liberty, and I just want to compare the size. I was like, oh, I don't know. So she said, okay, I hung up. Then she called me back with another question. I said, okay, hold on. If you're going to do this, and I, today's supposed to be my day off, I'll just come up there to the building. I think that's what she wanted to happen in the first place. When I got to the building and I walked in, the Lord spoke to me right there. And spoke to me and said, this is your church. And at that moment, I didn't know how much it cost. I didn't even know if it was still available. I just knew it was our church. It was just a steel building with garage doors. But I saw a cathedral complex. I saw the people standing around. I mean, I saw where the stage was going to be. And we began to talk about where everything was going to be with confidence and these uh, these were foreign owners of the property and they were talking to us asking us questions and we were asking them questions as though we had money to, to write a check right then <laughs> we didn't have any money we had great faith we had great zeal great passion and something that we always calculated in the ramps history is the favor of God we always won because of the favor of God and so we looked at the expenses and we realized that we were paying at that time $750 a month at the storefront cathedral <laughs> which for us was a lot because we were college students but this new property with expenses was going to cost us over $7,000 a month what? yeah from $750 a month to over $7,000. And I believe God wanted us to do it. And so I was waiting for the paperwork. Just waiting for the paperwork. I'm telling everybody we're moving. This is our building. And the man says we're just going to get with our lawyers. We're going to get with our people and draft up the paperwork. And you can move into the building. Well, the man stopped responding. The owners of the building, I kept waiting for the paperwork. And finally, one day I went to the Bible study down at our little storefront church. And the man called me and he said to me, Pastor Younger, uh, I, I regret to give you this phone call. But I'm not going to be able to, to lease the building to the church. I said, huh? 
what, what, what's going on? He said, there's someone who wants to build a hotel right here and their investors have already lined up and they've already put thousands of dollars in plans and blueprints and so it's going to go through he says i wanted to help the church i wanted to be there for the church but uh, i need to make this decision for my family it's like oh okay he says i apologize to put you in this situation uh, what are you going to tell the church i said to him I'm not going to tell the church anything. He said, he said, you're just not going to say anything? I said, no, I'm not going to say anything to the church because God had already spoken to me and told me that that building is our building. He said, okay, but the man's investors are already lined up. I said, yes, Pastor, but I don't want to come off as a Jesus freak to you, but when I walked in that building, God already spoke to me and told me that that building was ours. He says, well, you're very confident. He said, the only thing that will happen, if they don't sign tomorrow by 12 o'clock, I'll let you sign. And I, But I'm so confident that they are. I've already talked to their investors. It's not gonna happen. But hey, even if it happens, I'll take you and your staff out to lunch. I said, okay. When I got off the phone with him, I had a moment, right? I had a moment and I was getting ready to go and kneel at the altar and cry and say, God, please. But at that moment, it's like the gift of faith stood up in me. And I was like, Lord, I trust you. You've already said it's mine, so it's nothing to beg you for. I trust you. And that night, I'll never forget it. It was a Wednesday night. My mother came into the building. She was the first person to get to church. And I almost said something to my mother. So I said nothing to her. I said nothing to anyone. I went through Bible study like I usually do. And after that, I went back over to the organ to play and to let people give announcements. I said, are there any announcements? I was washing dishes and me and my husband were talking. It was, it was early in the morning. It was on a Wednesday. It was early in the morning. And I was washing dishes. And, um, and God spoke to me. He said to tell your pastor that I'm going to perform a miracle today. I'm going to perform a miracle. And that's all, and, and I'm telling you, and when, the, when God spoke that to me, I mean, I started speaking in tongue. I got chills all over my body. I went into uh, to praise and worship you know, in my house, my husband and I. And it was just unbelievable, I mean, how the Spirit of God just moved. And I knew that this was God because of the feeling that I, that I always get when God moves on me. And so, and then we prepared to go to, to Bible study that night. And um, we were praising and worship like we always do. And Bishop was getting ready to close out. He's with us. Is, is there anybody that has anything? And I said, I said, and I just stood up like, you know, like a jack-in-the-box, just jumped up. And I said, Bishop, um, Bishop, uh, uh, Pastor, he was a pastor. I said, Pastor Younger, God told me to tell you that he was going to do, give you a miracle. I mean, not knowing. And then when I said that, oh my goodness. Wow. Out of all of these years, I tell that story. It still hits me right here when I tell it. How the God of the universe would be so intentional about me and about the call that's on my life that he would tap on the shoulder of a woman washing dishes and send a message to me that he heard me when I prayed. Not by chance, not by coincidence, no one knew. And so when that happened, I jumped off the organ and I took off running around the church in our Pentecostal apostolic expression. And you know what they did? They ran with me. Because that's what we did. We've been doing that all of the life of the Ramp Church. We dance together. We run together. We cry together. We do it better when we do it together. So after church, I took just a few of them, a few people that were leaders of the church, to come into my office. I said, I have something to tell you. I didn't want to say it. But they said that they have changed their mind about leasing the property to us. I said, but... They, the investors have to sign by tomorrow and I need you all to do me a favor meet me there tomorrow at 12 o'clock you know the Bible said in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 
that they didn't have to fight the battle, but they did have to show up. So the next day we showed up. We went to that building and we got to the front desk and the lady says, how can I help you? I said, we want to see the owner. We want to talk to him. She said, well, he's on the phone, but you can go over to the building and I'll tell him to come talk to you when he gets off the phone. We, was out, we were out in the parking lot praying and then all of a sudden the man comes out of his office, walks across the parking lot with a folder in his hand and with his head kind of and his disposition kind of down he said, I want to ask you a question. I said, yes sir. He said, where do you want to eat lunch? That Sunday I went back to our church and we preached the message. This is our last day in hurt. Because we were in a, our church was in Hurt, Virginia, so my message was tongue in cheek. This is our last day in Hurt, and we was like, we out of here. <laughs> we out of here. We piled up everything on U-Hauls, vans, put, piled up our whole church in a U-Haul, and we moved into Lynchburg, Virginia. And after we got there, before our Sunday service that week, the city of Lynchburg shut us down.